It was, by any standard, a rough few days for Jesus. He had visited his hometown of Nazareth where he entered the synagogue and taught the worshipers, but rather than be impressed with his teaching, many of them questioned his authority since he was the son of their local carpenter and his wife Mary, and because they knew his siblings by name. Matthew says they took offense at him. Jesus responded by noting how only in his hometown and in his own house is a prophet without honor. Because of their lack of faith, Jesus didn't perform many miracles in Nazareth. As though that weren't enough, soon thereafter, Jesus was greeted by the terrible news that Teresa just mentioned, that John the Baptist had been beheaded. Not only was this the loss of one of his relatives, perhaps his cousin, and the death of the person who had boldly proclaimed Jesus' special status at the time of his baptism, but John's murder was a stark reminder of what too often happened to prophets in those days, and thus acted as foreshadowing of what lay ahead for Jesus. This was terrible news indeed for Jesus, who was, after all, fully human as well as fully divine, meaning he knew the painful trials of life that we experience. It should come as no surprise then that Jesus decided to withdraw privately to a solitary or deserted place. Even the Son of God needed time now and then to be alone, just as anyone who has had a number of stressful experiences needs to have some quiet time perhaps spent in prayer and meditation. Unfortunately for Jesus, however, when the crowds from surrounding towns, apparently persons who had benefited from <clears throat> his healings and teachings, learned that he had withdrawn to a solitary place, they followed him there, thus making the place no longer solitary. Jesus had traveled there by boat, and I guess he told his disciples where he was headed, and somebody let the word out, because when he went ashore, a great crowd was already waiting for Jesus. Today's scripture passage from Matthew chapter 14 is, of course, a miracle story, but one sort of miracle over, often overlooked is the amazing response of Jesus. Rather than become frustrated by the sight of so many people waiting for him to, with their needs and wants, thus taking away from him any opportunity for meaningful rest and relaxation, Jesus had compassion for them and cured their sick. He who must have yearned for a little compassion himself was the one instead who gave it to others. That perhaps is the first miracle of sorts found within this story. It shows how Jesus <clears throat> was constantly motivated to act from a compassionate heart. The implication for us as his followers is clear. The second miracle is <clears throat> what happened next, and it was an important one too because it's the only miracle of Jesus included within all four gospel accounts. When evening came, Jesus' disciples approached him, and they suggested sending the crowds to, into the nearby villages where they could buy food for themselves. The disciples figured it was late, they must be hungry, this is a good solution. Jesus' response, however, was more than a little puzzling to the disciples. He said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. Yeah, right, the disciples must have thought. In fact, their reply to Jesus confirms this thinking. They said, we have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. We have nothing. Basically, that's what they were saying to Jesus. The five loaves of bread and the two fish were just a tiny drop in the bucket, certainly not enough to feed any more than a handful of the crowd, which numbered 5,000 men plus women and children, according to Matthew. We have nothing, was the straightforward recognition by the disciples that they themselves were absolutely powerless to do anything of a significant nature to feed the crowds or otherwise help them in any meaningful way. It was far beyond their capability. We have nothing. <clears throat> it was this self-understanding, however, which was most important in the disciples' spiritual development, in my opinion. Because until they realized and accepted their complete dependence on Jesus for all that they needed, they would never become effective agents of God's grace through Christ. <clears throat> you and I must also reach a similar conclusion, I believe, that we have nothing. 
when it comes to what we need to be effective followers of Jesus. Only then, with that humble self-awareness, will we look to Jesus to give us what we require to be made whole and to be His faithful disciples, His faithful servants. After the disciples, in effect, held up their hands and admitted their helplessness, Jesus instructed them to bring the five loaves and the two fish to Him, and He ordered the crowds to be seated on the grass. And then He took the bread and the fish, and He looked up to heaven. He blessed the food and broke the breads, the loaves of bread, and He handed them to the disciples to distribute among the crowd of people. And all ate and were filled, Matthew reports, and there were 12 basketfuls left over, one for each of the disciples to remind them of God's awesome power. As students of the Hebrew Bible, they likely would have noticed the similarity between what had just happened and what took place when their forebears had traveled to another deserted place, the Sinai wilderness. When those who also had nothing received manna from heaven by the gracious act of the Lord during their exodus from Egypt, they might also have remembered the story about Elisha from 2 Kings when the prophet divided 20 loaves of barley bread among 100 men and they all ate with some left over. Now, one might argue that those men may have just been conservative in how much bread they ate. But Jesus' action in today's scripture was clearly a miracle given the number of persons who were fed, 5,000 men plus women and children. And given that they ate to their fill with more bread left over, than Jesus was handed at first. This was clearly a miracle, and the gospel writers are making sure we get that. And in preserving this story, the gospel writers wanted to make it clear that Jesus was more than just a prophet. He was the very Son of God, who demonstrated power only God Himself could have. The disciples, however, could not have imagined such a miracle before they witnessed it with their own eyes. When Jesus told them to feed the crowds, the disciples could only see what they didn't have, not yet recognizing the power that Jesus had. That was, perhaps, why Jesus challenged them as He did, to open their eyes to this reality. As Carrie Myers writes, Jesus wanted them to do the impossible, the kind of miracle that is only possible by the power of God. The disciples were thinking too small. They were thinking in human terms, keenly aware of their limitations. And as they calculated the cost of such a feast, they neglected to factor in one critical figure, Jesus. Myers adds, Yet we dare not judge the disciples too harshly, for we too have seen the power of God and still fail to imagine the possibilities. We miss opportunities to serve because we rely too heavily on our own strength and capabilities. And like the disciples, we too would send the people away, missing an opportunity to serve because we too often lack the faith to ask for a miracle. This was indeed a miracle that took place when the 5,000 plus were fed. But Jesus' statement to His disciples before He performed it when He said, you give them something to eat, causes me to wonder about the possible nature of this miracle. What exactly did Jesus intend to teach His followers, including you and me, when He told the disciples to feed the people? As we've already noted, the disciples were quick to point out that they had nothing but a few loaves of bread and some fish not enough to make a dent in the hunger of the crowd. And yet, after Jesus took those few loaves of bread and a couple of fish, He made them into something much more, much more than enough to feed the 5,000 men plus women and children. And in truth, it was the disciples then, under the direction of Jesus, who did feed the crowds in obedience to Jesus' challenge for them to give the people something to eat as they handed out the multiplying bread and fish. And so, what the disciples learned firsthand was that what appeared to be impossible was actually possible, but only by the power of God in Christ. They could give the people what they needed because of Jesus. So the lessons they learned, the lesson they learned was to rely on the Lord for all of their needs. That's why I I said earlier that it was important for the disciples, as well as for you and me, to understand that we have nothing apart from the Lord in terms of what we truly need. It sounds counterintuitive, but only by accepting that one has nothing does one thereafter receive everything 
from God in Christ. We have nothing on our own. That key awareness opens our eyes of faith to the source of all of our gifts. I've been reminded of this truth lately. Many of you know my mother has been very ill and in the hospital in Chesapeake, Virginia. I've made a number of trips up there to be with her, to care for her as best I'm able, to be an advocate for her in the hospital and a second set of eyes in terms of what she needs. It's proved to be critical in her care as her health was on a downward track and I was worried that she was nearing a point from which she might not be able to recover. That's still a question mark right now. Obviously, my, my close relationship with her gave her much needed encouragement to do such essential things as drink liquids and eat food. On these basic life-sustaining tasks, she was falling short. But this week, when I was sitting with my mother one evening and looking at her in her very feeble condition, when I was trying to figure out how she could possibly manage in a new facility, a rehab facility to which she was being transferred, where there might be less attentive care, it was clear that I have nothing. I have nothing by myself, that is. Without God, I have nothing. We have nothing. But with God, I have everything. We have everything. My mother is in God's hands. This I know. Irrespective of what I may or may not do for her, her life is in God's hands. And that assurance brings me great comfort and peace. It also gives me the strength I need to be a good and effective caregiver for my mom because it's also true that I rest in God's hands as well. I can't do what I need to do for my mother on my own, but with God's power, with God's love, I can do what I need to do. And as the disciples discovered when faced with the 5,000 plus hungry folks and only a few of the loaves and only a few loaves of bread and fish to feed them, what isn't possible apart from God is amazingly possible with God. We can draw strength from the truth that we don't have to do it alone, that we can't do it alone because God is right there with us to hold us up and sustain us. Thursday, when I was <clears throat> sitting with my mother as she struggled even to talk and I contemplated the challenges of her future care that I noted a moment ago, I was checking email and came across one from Kate Bowler, whom I mentioned in a sermon recently. The email wasn't just to me, of course, but to all who had subscribed to her communications regarding her book, The Lives We Actually Live, 100 Blessings for Imperfect Days, which was a gift to me and others from Rob Webb. The timing was, for me, well, providential. It was entitled, this, this blessing, A Blessing for Caregivers, right while I was sitting in the hospital with my mother. I'm reading this. And obviously it spoke to my heart. Here's what she said in this blessed blessing, which will likely resonate with all of you who have been caregivers for loved ones who are ill. Blessed are we for whom the love Excuse me, blessed are we for whom the call to loving action is still strong, whose every urge is to keep going, keep working, and not count the cost. And yet blessed are we beginning to notice that we are slowing down inexplicably or just pausing, staring for no reason or starting something, but quickly turning to another demand. Blessed are we realizing that we are beginning to lose the thread. Blessed are we who say, I really can't keep going like this, at this pace, under this weight, and also the momentum is so strong I can't stop. God, come and be the hands that sit me down and keep me there long enough for me to really feel what I feel and know what I know. Come and be the wisdom to find the support system that is broad enough, kind enough, effective enough to meet the needs that are here, both mine and theirs. Come and be the peace that frees me to let my hands lie gently open a while, the grace to just receive. 
Seek the rest you need and a little bit more. It is a sacred space. The disciples said to Jesus, we have nothing. Nothing here but five loaves and two fish. Bring them here to me, Jesus said. And he took those loaves. He looked up to heaven with thankfulness, blessed them, broke them, and handed them to the disciples to share with the crowds. And somehow the impossible happened as all in the crowd ate and were filled. Without Christ, this would have been impossible. But with Christ Jesus our Lord, this miracle and all miracles, big and small, become possible. Praise the Lord. Amen.